stay hungry, stay foolish. So now on Innovation Show, we welcome Dennis Mortensen, CEO and founder of X.ai. Thank you very much for having me. We met because I'm a user of your awesome agent, Amy Ingram, which looks after all my diary scheduling, etc. I'm really enjoying it, so thank you for that. But, but before we talk about X.ai, it would be great to talk about you and your backstory because you have a really interesting entrepreneurial spirit. Here's the... Funny thing, which if you look at my CV, isn't really quite visible. It's probably the opposite because I've done five ventures over 20 years. So it looks like I set out to do this and nothing but this. But the original plan, because my dad and my uncles and cousins are all entrepreneurs, I wanted to be really just a CS grad, go work 5 p.m., go home at 4, have the weekend off, really just live a happy life. That was the original plan, because I certainly didn't want to be an entrepreneur or do any startups. But what happened was, as I was taking my CS degree, I did game development, and the company which I worked for ended up going bankrupt. And I was just, to be honest, so pissed, because the original plan was that they would pay me I would pay off my student debt and I would go work for IBM. That was it, my master plan. And they just fucked it up. Yeah. So I had my counsel go buy the assets of that company. And that sounds really dramatic. It wasn't because this was back in the mid 90s, early 90s, really. And lawyers just didn't know anything about software. So I bought pretty much all the assets for about a thousand dollars. When the company refinanced and came back, I had figured out that I really bought all of the value. I made what I thought was a fortune back then, but in hindsight, a, a small pot of money. But certainly enough to kind of say, I am free. But I still didn't want to use that to go be an entrepreneur. So I thought, how about I just put it all on red, roll the dice one more time, lose it, and then go work for IBM. <laughs> okay. And that meant I started a big data internet consulting company uh, back in the mid-90s. And it was obviously just fantastic timing. And uh, we ended up with a wonderful exit on that company at the very height of the dot-com boom in April 2000. So I got out on the right side. But even after that, I took all of it and gambled it yet one more time because I thought, this time, I might be good enough to lose it. And we had another exit, and our prior prior company, we had another one to Yahoo, the last one to Outbrain, and now we've been at X.AI for the last three years. So that's my backstory, which is very opposite to one for where it looks like this is what I always wanted. It's the opposite of what I always wanted. But I think I reached the point now for where, at least 20 years in, this is my lot in life. Yeah, it's, but it's, it's amazing because you, you like, the, the difference between what you've done, what you wanted and what you're doing now is just incredible. And I think perhaps, and I'm not the expert here, that in some way, shape or form, we all end up just like our mom and dad. We might fight it, but in the end, we're just small replicas. And my dad ran his own company his whole life and here I am. Yeah, because it's true. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. <laughs> Not really. We fight it, but it is really a lost fight from the beginning, I think. Yeah, yeah. So it's it's in your blood. But uh, I, I think it's fascinating the way that, <coughs> that your early exit gave you runway to kind of do and make a difference in, in the world. I mean, what you're doing is incredible with X.ai. I have, if anything, and this might not even be the right show, but any young entrepreneur which I meet who have some opportunity to go have an exit at whatever size, take it. As in, don't tell yourself that I can be the next Snapchat or Facebook or Google. Perhaps you can, but this time around on your first exit, take it. 
take whatever they'll pay you. Even if you think it's a disgustingly low amount, take it. Because once you have that, you have an exit in your pocket, a little bit of money, and the freedom to go do whatever you want. And I think that whatever you want turns into a potential lifetime of entrepreneurship for where I certainly have been happy over the last 20 years of all the things that I've been able to do and the freedom to kind of go do what you think is right and not have that stress of, I also going to put my my kids through college, whatever the stress might be. So I'm just so much a fan of see if you cannot run towards that first exit as fast as you can. Because after that, you're just going to live really a happy life. And yeah. you don't really need that much money come the end of the day anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's interesting, actually, because uh, it is the right for this show because we have a lot of startups and young entrepreneurs that listen to this show because we have the other entrepreneurs on. So thank you for passing that advice <laughs> on. Uh, and if there's any more, we'd love to hear it. I think certainly the way I've come about the five ideas that I worked on and I worked on each one of them for about four or five years each have been not the outcome of some innovation setting over a weekend for where Aiden and Dennis get together with a couple of pizzas and some Diet Cokes and a whiteboard and over the next 16 hours we come up with a fantastic idea. I just don't personally believe in that as a process for what you should do next. So what I do is that I have this little list on my phone, which is really just a list of hate, which is that whenever there's something which annoys me in life, I add it to that list. Because right now, all I do and all I think about is x.ai, and that's all I can really go do, and I certainly couldn't imagine start to think about anything else, but I am constantly, like you, as a consumer, annoyed about services where I think they could and should do this better. So I just add it to my little list of hate. Just like when you're in line at Citibank and you think, oh, I hate this. <laughs> then you add it to your list and then you just move on with your day. And then one day you get to the exit of your company and you go back and you look at your list and you look at a list of four or five years of hate and thinking that is one angry kid. I and know. you start to go look at that list saying, Damn it, Dennis, that's not even an idea. Don't do that. <laughs> you cross it out. This, don't be so sad, dude. Then you delete that one. But in that list, there's a lot of gold. As in, why is it that I was constantly annoyed? Why is it that I see this multiple times in my list? And why is it that nobody solved it today? And on that list, you'll certainly see that I will wake up one morning at 6 a.m. and cry about the 140 emails in my inbox even when I was empty the night before. And within that kind of disappointment or hate comes this opening for where, what is it in my inbox that hurts so much? And one of the things that hurt a lot was setting up a meeting with Aiden for where, I want to speak to you. I certainly don't want to do the email ping pong back and forth, but I want to speak to you. So that was, again, one of those items that was in my list. But that's how I try to innovate, not through single individual weekend sessions, but four or five year long lists of hate if that makes any sense yeah it's great hate lists i love it <laughs> and, and because you're right because you can't force it like i, I was talking about you you're probably lucky enough you, you would have had these if you did go to ibm but be sent on i call them forced fun days where uh, the company is sent off to do some type of uh, hiking adventure together and all become friends on a weekend. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, and it's all like, oh, let's innovate. And everybody comes back excited and then goes back to their job and nothing happens. And it, the, the gradual way of finding hates or, or dislikes <laughs> is, the, is a way better way of doing it. That certainly worked uh, for me over, again, the last 20 years. The more I say 20 years, the sadder I become because that suggests that I'm getting older. But <laughs> it is true, though. Yeah. So, so one, of the, one of the hates on the list was, uh, was this inbox, cluttered inbox. Yes, it really started out with this, not idea, but pain of looking at that inbox every single day. So I run with the idea of getting to zero every night. So inbox zero is part of my process and I don't really leave the office without having removed every single email from my inbox. And some people believe in that, others don't. I believe outside of actually taking care of your emails, you provide a lot of mental freedom to go think about anything. 
because there's obviously nothing in my inbox. So I have no additional chores. I've got no other work to do. So I can just look out the window and be good with it. So I'm such a fan of doing that. But that comes at great pain. And I think that was certainly the catalyst. But killing the inbox altogether is just such, such a grand thing that is almost immediately impossible. But as you start to look into that inbox, there's a major obstacle, certainly for professionals, in just meeting up with people today, tomorrow, later, reschedule, cancels, multiple participant meetings, and all of that stuff. And certainly one of the worst things for me was that if I want to get to zero, and I've sent Aiden an email saying, hey, so how about we do Thursday, 9 a.m. EST? As you don't reply back, what do I do now then? Do I leave it in my inbox, which I don't like? Do I delete it and then just trust that you get back to me? And if you don't get back to me, do I have another list for where I follow up with you? And that just annoyed me. There was a certain amount of emails where it was not even on me. It was on the tardiness of the people that I was communicating with. So I just like this idea of having this assistant like Amy for where when I do want to meet up with Aiden, I can simply say, yeah, I have CC'd in Amy. She can help put something on my calendar. And as I click send, I can immediately click archive. As in, now it's not my job anymore. It's between you and her. And whatever comes back in my inbox shouldn't really be anything but an invite. So that was certainly the, uh, the beginning. And I could see how don't kill the whole inbox, but find that major pain point. And certainly one that really annoyed me when you work with inbox zero. Yeah, and, and it's funny because I found I found out about it via somebody who works that way, which was near Eyal, uh, the author of the uh, hooked uh, hooked on how habits start in your life. Uh, near's a, a future guest on the show, and he sent me uh, a media request via Amy. I just presumed it was his PA because it was so polite, and then I realised, and then I clicked on the link, and I was like, oh my god, this is an agent. And then then I found you, and I was like, oh, this is awesome because the productivity that it can lead to, like you said, I'm not thinking about my inbox anymore. I'm not thinking about those back and forth, the ping pong of trying to arrange a date. It just frees me up to do stuff that's more important. Exactly. And outside of full-time professional assistance, nobody was hired to do email ping pong back and forth, trying to figure out when to talk next. Not a sales guy, not an account manager, not somebody in customer support, not HR, but they all do it all the time. But if I really look at what I wanted out of that HR person, that was to recruit these 11 people to interview as many good candidates as possible. Not one for where, ah, we only interviewed four. I could have interviewed five had I've had a little bit of help, but hey, there's only so many hours in the day. That shouldn't really be her response. Her response would be that, hey, after I got this agent, I can actually interview two or three more every week so that the quality of the candidates which we now bring in and the people which we hire is just a little bit better than it used to be. Or that salesperson for where he, being on commission, certainly wouldn't say, I'm here to email. No, he's here to close deals, to talk to as many customers, as potential customers as possible, to do as many demos as possible, not to do email ping pong. And as soon as he sold the client on the idea that he should do the demo next week, his response should be not, what do you think about Thursday or Friday? It should be, great, I am super eager to do the demo. I have CC'd my sister, Amy. She can help put something on the calendar come in the next week. And then Amy will just be super diligent, as in even better than him because he's on to the next call now. Now she'll reach out, help at 10 p.m. Is, if that's when he sent the email, or over the weekend, if you need to set it up on Monday or in the middle of the night, if somehow that the client responds, say, from a different time zone in Singapore. And all of a sudden, that change is not just one for where you free up resources. I think there's real opportunity cost that is baked into what you do for where you will make more sales, hire better people, keep your customers more happy by having some of this help. I know I'm biased here, but th that's really how I think about it. Yeah, and, uh, and it does. I mean, we 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 talk about it on this show about 
uh, having more time to work on the business, not in the business. Like you said about looking out the, the window and having that time to do so is so important to actually for productivity level. And surely, you know, you, you've talked about this before where there's a world coming where you're hiring me, Aiden comes for a job on X.ii, and you say to me, uh, let's see your CV, and you go, look, he's using these five different agents to do these five different things. He's going to be more productive. I have certainly not even, I think, a contrarian view on the future. I think this is inevitable that we'll get to a point for where me hiring Aiden just on your CV and a set of skills that you picked up in college 20 years ago seems so suboptimal that it's embarrassing. No, I would hire you because of either newly acquired skills or, as you allude to here, a set of intelligent agents that you have employed. And this is, I think, perhaps not easy to agree on if you look at this from the outside, but take a few steps back because I actually think we've been through this before for where, remember, there used to be so much friction if you brought in your own device to the organization. You work for IBM, you bring your own laptop or your own phone and you connect to the corporate mail server and IT come running to your desk saying, what the hell are you doing, Aiden? Are you crazy? We can't expose our data and your own personal laptop and what security did you put in place? Now, it is somewhat just expected that if I hire somebody that you bring your own smartphone, I'll be almost disappointed if one of my employees did not have their mail account set up on their own smartphone. That almost suggests that they are disengaged, as in they aren't really as enthusiastic as I had hoped for. So that has completely flipped, that it is not just Aiden, it's Aiden and his devices that I hire. You bring your own IT infrastructure, and that's really just something we don't even think about anymore. That is just natural. But I think this is going to be equally natural for where, of course, Aiden won't set up his own meetings. He'll have some agent to do that. Of course, he's not going to go scan his own receipts. Of course, he's not going to book his own travels. That's silly. Now, I asked Aiden to do this for me, not all these other kind of little chores. So I, I do think it's coming. And around this office, we call it bring your own agent, very much like bring your own device. And I think this is a new era, certainly over the next half decade for where we're going to get used to that. Yeah, and, and it, it brings up the question, I mean, if you think about people in the world who may have struggled in the past of, of where rote tasks were were, optim were were seen as an optimal thing to do. So for some, somebody, for example, with dyslexia, uh, th that doesn't matter anymore. They're freed up to be the creative people they are. Uh, and AI allows this because it's going to do all those jobs for them, including driving the car and, and all the kind of things to make them more productive or let them focus on what's important. And I couldn't agree more. And the way we think about this is that there'll be some rather dramatic paradigm shift in how software is being delivered. So over the last, not even many decades, probably over the last half century, software have been something which will empower you or really assist you in doing a job a little bit faster, a little bit more accurate. Meaning that if I ask you to do a financial model for your venture for 2017, you will go back and figure out what data to look at and boot up Excel and work on it for weeks. And once done, you will take credit for that job. You certainly would have been handicapped had you not had Excel at your disposal, but you will still take credit for the job as in Aiden did the financial model. The answer is what you're being given credit for. I'm not so sure that in this new paradigm, which I think is about to arrive, for where it is not about software assisting you, it is about you handing over a job to a piece of software, as in you describe an objective, then the software will do that job for you. And that might sound subtle, but that is a major shift. There's a major shift between you jumping into Excel and figuring out whether a given marketing campaign provides you a better return over another one or whether there's a better margin on customers in the US versus Australia or whatever the question might be. But that work you do in there, that is something for where in the future you'll just describe that to an agent where 
your analysis agent called Tommy, you will go ask him saying, hey, the campaigns that I've been running over the last three months and the customers we acquired off of those campaigns, do I have a better margin on the US customers over the domestic ones? That's a good question. Doing the work and providing the answer used to be, or certainly today is what you're being rewarded for. I think the future is one where coming up with that answer, now that's the easy part. There's no reward in that. Coming up with the question, that is where all the value is. So in this software paradigm shift for where we go from, it assisting you to doing the job, we will flip what you're going to be rewarded on for where today you're going to be rewarded on the answer and tomorrow you're going to be rewarded on the question. And that suggests, again, as you allude to, that perhaps there's a whole set of people here who might have been handicapped in the past who will really shine in the future because they had splendid questions, really good intuitive understanding of the organization. They just didn't have the skill set. They still had all the right questions, though. Yeah. So that is a future I'm excited about. Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree more. Like, it, it's, it's actually so exciting that, that that's going to happen, this change, and uh, that the world's going to be a better place and a, a more productive place. And I suppose the the kind of metrics of success in businesses are going to change dramatically. So, D Dennis, with regards to X.ai, when is it going on, on public release? Because I, I think th so many people have asked me uh, that question since I started using it and Amy's been uh, organizing my diary. Sure. Let me just rewind a little bit now that I have you here and we're recording this semi-live, so there's no stopping me. Let's just uh, reiterate exactly what X.AI sure, is. Yeah. Good call. So we do nothing more than schedule meetings. And we are this intelligent agent, which is not a piece of software you install or an app or an extension or a plugin. We're simply just an email. Something where if you were to hire a human tomorrow called Jesse and put him in your front office, he would not really be anything but Jesse and he will have an email called Jesse at something and whenever you want Jesse to do something you email Jesse and ask him hey Jesse would you be so kind and do this and that for you Amy exists within the exact same paradigm for where as I receive an email from you asking hey do you have time to do this podcast I'm doing and as I look at that email I know immediately yeah that sounds fun. We should certainly do that. And at that moment for where I've taken that decision, my next task is one for where I CC in, in my email client, amy at x.ai, which is just an email address. And then I describe in natural language, hey, Aiden, sure, we should do that. Return, return. Amy, would you be so kind and set something up come first week of September, please? come some afternoon on Skype. Her job now is to understand who is Dennis? Do I work for him? What did he just ask me to do? Oh, set up a meeting under these constraints. Let me remove him from the conversation. Then let me reach out to Aiden again in natural language and start to kind of suggest sometimes. You reply back to Amy. She'll have this very human-like conversation with you to the degree for where many people don't even recognize that this is a machine. Not that this is a game of whether we can fool them, but it's done so well and so natural that they don't recognize. Upon the end of this negotiation, she understand that it's been concluded. And upon conclusion, she'll send out a very traditional standard invite, which goes into your calendar. And as you listen to this, there's nothing new here. You've seen this play out 10,000 times before because we've had human personal assistants that have done this job. And we're really not trying to reinvent that. We're trying to completely replicate that of having a human in place. The only difference is that you don't have to pay $50,000 for it. You can pay 30 bucks instead. So just a dramatic change in price, but the exact same quality, if not actually better. So that's who we are and what we are trying to solve. No more, no less than that. Yeah, and it's, w it's w one of the things from your hate list, <laughs> which is great. And you've dealt <laughs> yes. with it. Cross, tick. Tick. And yeah. when you say dealt with it, I actually did the very sad thing of counting my own meetings back in 2012, the year before we started. And I did 1,019 meetings 
in that year. And even sadder, I had 672 reschedules. Wow. I did it all myself. And wow. not as in, ah, oh, that was fun. He was giggling around the office with a Diet Coke in hand setting up his meetings. No, I was not. I was sitting at home alone at 11 p.m. in my underwear crying, trying to set up <laughs> these meetings. So it's not what you imagine. So this is something where for those who don't have an assistant, they have this almost immediate relief, the joy of finally, as in now I don't have to do this. So coming back to your question, so when are we going to bring this to market? We almost had to be instantly in market, but with a closed beta from day one, because we need to train on these meetings. So this AI is not going to build itself. It's going to build itself by seeing hundreds of thousands of meetings and millions and millions of emails, because the more we see, the smarter Amy becomes. So we will go to market with three distinct editions, very similar to Dropbox or Slack, if you will, meaning that there will be a free edition for where you can do a limited amount of meetings per month, five, and hopefully you will fall in love and you want to have unlimited meetings, change the signature, add VIP contacts, and so on and so forth. And for that, we have a professional edition, which is for the single individual. And hopefully you fall in love with it to the extent where you showcase it to a colleague, and then the organization will buy it. And for that, we have a business edition for where you can roll it out to everybody, move it to your domain, get a single invoice, and so on and so forth. And that's how we're going to go to market. We are slowly testing the professional edition this autumn. And come end of this year and the very first days of next year, we'll be testing the business edition. And almost in opposite order here, the free edition will be pushed in 2017. But we're still adding people to the free edition every single day, but as in being able for you to go to the website, sign up, start using it immediately. That will be at some point in 2017. It's a brilliant way to release it because as you say, you need to teach, you need to see all the different variations of different emails, how people write, geolocation, how people might set up a meeting differently in each country. This is one of those verticals for where there's a very high expectation on the accuracy which we can provide. And I think perhaps it's even better to kind of explain if I suggest to, the, to you that it rhymes with that of a self-driving car, perhaps not as dramatic, but certainly rhymes with it. So self-driving cars today, and what are we now almost seven years into that endeavor? Google itself is about seven years into their endeavor. They certainly solved many of the challenges, but if they launched it tomorrow and said, hey, ta-da, here we are. You can now go buy a self-driving car, footnote, for every 10,000 miles, we're going to kill a pedestrian. That is the same as saying that product can't be in market because you can't bloody kill a pedestrian for every 10,000 miles, however fantastic and sophisticated the software. So they need super high accuracy. I don't need accuracy to that degree, but there's certainly an expectation for it. If you ask Amy to set up 10 meetings, she'll set up 10 meetings, not eight out of 10. So we need something for where this works when you ask your assistant to do a job, she does that job. So we really want to make sure that we don't go to market with something which is almost there. It needs to be stellar. And that's why we're very careful about rolling it out. Yeah, or at least that's my defense. Yeah, absolutely. No, absolutely. And it's the way to do it. And, and uh, it, it's, it, your, your advice for startups has been fantastic. One, one last question, De Dennis, is around the human element of AI. I know that's a, a dichotomy, but... Um, I, I've noticed, right, where people, um, it, like, I, I kind of feel almost like Amy's one of the team and in a way that you're, 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 you're almost driven to thank Amy, even though you know it's AI. And I, I wonder, I often wonder, is there metrics where you can actually tell what type of boss, essentially, Amy's working with by the language they use with her? Do, do you know what I mean? So it's kind of, I, I wonder about the human element on all this and how that plays out. We think about that a lot here. So I think anybody who will do any agent in the future will have to decide whether they humanize it or not. And that is a black and white decision. 
You can't really do anything in the middle. So either you believe that it should be Google now or that it should be Alexa or Amy Ingram or Siri. And you need to make that call. And if you make that call to humanize it, you should go all in and invest heavily into that so that when you speak to Amy on Monday and on Friday and in two months from now, it feels like the same entity, the same person, not just three different templates, but something for where I know Amy. I know how she talks, how she communicates with me. That is her. And we've really spent time on that. And you're absolutely right that people will, even when told that this is machine-driven, thank her. We see her be the employee of the month at startups. We see her receive flowers and chocolate and whiskey to the office. And not to disappoint people, but a lot of that whiskey and chocolates is consumed by Steffi and I. But, you know, in, <laughs> in the end, I don't think there's anything sad about recognizing that this is a machine. And I don't think it's a game of fooling people. So what we certainly like to do here is make sure that people are aware up front that this is machine driven, but do a job so good that you still want to treat it like a human. And we do have, for example, a gratitude intent, as in the system can detect when somebody thanks Amy. And the reason for that is that we need to know exactly what people are talking about so we can take no action on that message, just be happy about it. And that happens not once every blue moon. We looked at it in a study probably half a year ago, but in 11 percent of all the meetings we do, at least one of the emails in that chain will have just a gratitude intent, as in somebody emailed Amy just to give her a virtual pat on the back, just to say thank you, really appreciate you setting up the meeting this week, or so sorry for getting back so late. That I find really interesting, because I thought that this would be a decade-long shift for where we would move from traditional software for where there's really no emotional connect. You might love Photoshop as a, an application and think it's wonderful, but there's no emotional connect really. Here, we've seen that almost immediate emotional connect. And if you want to see something funny, by the way, you should go to x.ai slash love notes. And what you'll see is thousands of people who have done two things immediately, not over half a decade, immediately. One, they went straight to talking about what we do as her. She, not as in, I installed this application the other day, which is now doing this one thing which I hate to do and I'm very happy about it. No, my new friend, Amy, she's doing a wonderful job in scheduling my meetings. And that I thought would take much longer, but that was instant. And the other keyword when you look through that list is they talk about not help or being assisted, but as jobs. They recognize, they take no credit, as in, hey, I'm also a good boss and I do really fantastic handovers for where I kind of spoon feed her all the information. No, just relief, she did a wonderful job. Those two keywords, she and job, that really makes my day. Uh, so we're going to see a lot more of this and that personally kind of makes me excited. Yeah, and, and it, it, I have to say, I am one of the the eleven percent that I I often would say thanks when it's and especially when it's unexpected things like you've scheduled a meeting two two months ago, and all of a sudden Amy comes along and says just to remind you I I set this one a long time ago you might have forgotten about it going I actually did thank you Amy <laughs> you know and it's it's great and it's so exciting and you know you're talking about gratitude my gratitude to you for taking such a, a long piece of time to talk to us. Uh, really appreciate it, Dennis, and Dennis Mortensen, CEO and founder of X.ai. Thank you very much for having me. Cheers, mate. Thank you, man. <laughs>